Hi and welcome to today's event. My name is Jude and I'm a librarian for Kirkley's Libraries. May is Local and Community History Month, so what better time to premiere the power of protest, Black abolitionists in 19th century Kirkley's. An amazing piece of local history that Kirkley's residents, like me, may not have known about before. We're super proud to be sharing it today and our kind of journey started in September 2020, which feels a very long time ago now, when a few of us went on a virtual tour, a virtual black abolitionist tour of London, which was led by Dr. Hannah Rose Murray, who we'll all be meeting a bit later. And from that, we discovered that black abolitionists visited Kirklees during their 19th century tour of Britain. And a partnership between Dr. Hannah Rose Murray of the University of Edinburgh, Kirklees Libraries, West Yorkshire Archive Service, Kirklees Council's BAME network and community cohesion team was born. And the outcome is the virtual tour that shines a light on five abolitionists who campaigned across, UK, across Kirklees to end the cruel trade. And if you missed any of the partners' introductions to the tour, you can watch them here. I'll just grab the banner for that. You can go to Kirklees Libraries YouTube, or you can go to our website, which is here. Kirklees power of protests, black abolitionists in 19th century Kirklees. And also, Kirklees Libraries have created a collection of books, a collection of books to complement the tour. And those can be found here on our Overdrive site, which is kirklees.overdrive.com. Plus, we're having a paper copy of Hannah Rose Murray's Advocates of Freedom, her latest books so that's going to be coming to libraries soon. So keep your eyes open for that too. Just get the last little bit of details up. And I'd just like to remind people to send any questions, comments that they have to us during the tour. And you can do that by going to the chat box on YouTube, Facebook or Twitter, and they'll come directly to us. And we'll answer as many as we can during today's live tour. So, oh, the other thing I need to mention is we'd love to know where you're watching from. Maybe you're all from Kirklees, maybe you're from further afield. So pop that in the chat box too and send it over to us because we always want to know how many people and who's watching and where from. So that would be absolutely fab. I'll move on swiftly now and I'd like to introduce you to Rob. He's going to tell you a little bit about West Yorkshire Archive Service and their role within this project. Thanks, Dude. You, Hi. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, so, yes, I'm Rob, and I'm the archivist here at the Kirklees Archives office in Huddersfield Library. Um, I'll be very quick, as I don't want to take any time away from Dr. Murray. I know we're all very excited to hear what she's going to be telling us about this fascinating story. Um, but I just wanted to say that here in the archives, um, we've been thrilled to be part of this project um, and to help uncover this incredible part of Kirklees' history. Um, in the archives, we look after lots of records that relate to all of the sites that we'll be discovering, um, sorry, covering on this tour. Um, but it wasn't until we started work on this project that we actually found out that these places and their communities actually played a part in the history of the important, hugely important abolitionist movement, which just goes to show what remarkable hidden histories we can still all uncover about our local areas, um, particularly here in the archives. So I just want to say to everyone watching today, um, that if this event piques your interest and you want to find out a little bit more about the history of your family, your street or community, then please do get in touch with us as we'd be delighted to help you get started with your research. I'll um, just hopefully, up thank you. Our contact Sorry. details should be on the screen soon. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, Jude. Um, thanks. And there's another one there. And finally, the phone number. Thank you. Um, we care for over 30,000 boxes of archives that relate to the whole of the Kirklees area, dating from the 12th century right up to the present day. So I'm certain that we'll be able to help you find archives that directly relate to you and your interests. So please do get in touch. So um, thanks for your time. And very excitedly, we'll pass you over to Dr. Hannah Rose Murray at the University of Edinburgh um, for the reason we're all here. 
Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Jude and Rob, for that very, very kind introduction. I'm just going to share my screen so you can see the first slide of my PowerPoint. Hopefully, you should see that. So welcome to our virtual Black Abolitionist walking tour. Thank you so much for joining us wherever you are in the world and obviously to Kirk Lee's area as well. I hope you're all safe and healthy. And with the amazing collaboration of Kirk Lee's Libraries, Kirk Lee's BAME Network, the West Yorkshire Archive Service, um, Community Cohesion Team, among many others, we've put together this virtual tour that highlights the activism of African-American freedom fighters who travel to Britain to Kirk Lee's specifically to lecture against US chattel slavery. And the tour will just take about over an hour and we'll visit four sites. And we're going to be going through the streets of Kirk Lee's, um, through Google Earth, and then I'll flip to this PowerPoint with some of the images of the, the folks, the men and women who I'm going to be talking about, and these three individuals here, Moses Roper on the left-hand side, Frederick Douglass in the middle, and Ellen Craft on the right-hand side, all visited the Kirklees area. And finally, just before I get into the tour proper, I usually issue a content warning at the start of my talks and tours. I'm going to be talking about racism, slavery, racial violence, so it's really important to note that upfront and be aware of this. So the first thing I'm going to share is a map of um, black abolitionist speaking locations. And this is from my website. And this is uh, a work in progress as I've tried to essentially um, map as many speeches as possible throughout the British Isles. But let's just step back a little bit and focus on the context. So black activists, were central to the story of transatlantic abolition. And freedom fighters like Alada Equiano, who you may have heard of, Ignatius Sancho and Mary Prince were central to the abolition of the slave trade in 1807 in Britain and slavery across the British Empire by the end of the 1830s. And on the other side of the Atlantic, US chattel slavery or slavery as a whole had existed across the Americas since the 16th century but in terms of what we would call North America today, slavery had become firmly entrenched by the American Revolution, so the end of the 18th century. And it would take the US Civil War fought between 1861 and 1865, which led to the legal abolition of US chattel slavery in 1865. By that point, slavery was confined to the US South. But the main period that I'm going to be talking about, so between the 1840s and the 1860s roughly, there were 4 million women, men and children enslaved on sites from Maryland and Washington DC to Louisiana to Texas, all the way across the US South. And from the beginning, it's really important to note that African Americans resisted their oppression and their white oppressors in so many ways, from physically running away to Canada, to Britain, to Ireland, as well as shortly or near outside their plantations or their sites of enslavement, they formed maroon communities, for example, in the swamps of Florida and Louisiana. But on the site of enslavement itself, African Americans broke tools, they stole food, they held secret meetings, they fought back against their enslavers and white oppressors in so many ways. But for those of whom who did manage to escape, they formed the heart of the anti-slavery movement. And black women and men wrote about their experiences in autobiographical narratives or slave narratives. They lectured on abolitionist platforms, they wrote poetry, they composed paintings or illustrations to teach audiences about the realities and the brutalities of slavery. Now, during the 19th century, many of these survivors traveled across the Atlantic to England, to Ireland, to Scotland, and to Wales during the 19th century to inform British and Irish audiences about those same realities and brutalities of slavery. And as you can see from this map, they lectured in large cities. And as we'd expect, there are very high numbers of lectures 
in London, in Birmingham, in Liverpool and Manchester, as well as Newcastle and Edinburgh. But the really exciting thing and interesting and inspiring thing about this history is that African-Americans were also speaking in tiny fishing villages. They spoke in town halls in small city, uh, small villages like Ventnor on the Isle of Wight, for example. They spoke in Calicotes, which is just outside of Newcastle. They spoke in Lamberis at the very foot of what is now Snowdonia National Park. Keswick in the Lake District, Bakewell in the Peak District, for example. Now, I've managed to map about 4,700 speeches from around about the 1830s to the 1890s. But as I mentioned, it's a little bit of a daunting prospect because this represents a mere fraction of the actual numbers of lectures given throughout that period. And roughly, there are about 1,550 locations represented on this map. But as I say, it's been a work in progress. And through doing this amazing and collaborative project, I've got a few more lectures to add to that list. And they often relied on anti-slavery networks to um, speak in certain locations. So there are a lot of black abolitionists who would go to sites like Edinburgh and Newcastle and Liverpool and Manchester because abolitionists, British abolitionists were there and ready to welcome black freedom fighters to, and they would help organize their speaking tours, for example. But as I mentioned, they were also going off the beaten track in spe and speaking in very small lo and uh, rural locations. But why were they coming here more specifically? And I promise I will get to the specific sites in Kirklees in just a bit, but just to outline why they were coming over here in the first place. And one of the reasons was that they were coming to speak about their experiences and also publish their own autobiographical or slave narratives, which became a central part of the transatlantic anti-slavery movement. And what's fascinating is that the literary and commercial success of these narratives, at least on this side of the Atlantic, has largely been forgotten. But in numerous cases, these freedom fighters were outselling their Victorian contemporaries, at least in terms of initial sales. So just to give you an example, Frederick Douglass sold 13,000 copies of his narrative between 1845 and 1847. Fast forward to the 1870s, we have Josiah Henson, who sold about a quarter of a million copies of his slave narrative alongside a children's book in less than two years. When we look at the initial sales of Victorian authors like Lewis Carroll, who first published Alice in Wonderland in 1865, in over three and a half years, that novel had sold about 13,000 copies, so far less than Frederick Douglass and Josiah Henson. And again, fast forward to the rest of the century, the 1890s, when Bram Stoker published his Dracula at the end of the 1890s, Initial sales for that novel within a year and a half were about 3,000 copies. So dwarfed by the sale of these freedom fighters and their, and their narratives. Other reasons why African-Americans were coming over to Britain and Ireland, they were encouraging audiences here to sign anti-slavery petitions, to practice what they called non-fellowship with white enslavers, and also churches and other institutions that either supported slavery or refused to say anything against slavery or the slave trade. They raised money for specific anti-slavery societies, the American Anti-Slavery Society, the Canadian Anti-Slavery Society. They also raised money for the legal purchase of themselves or family members. So technically, when a freedom fighter escaped slavery in the eyes of the US government, they were still legally enslaved. So British abolitionists and British audiences would sometimes raise money and then quite crudely enter into a negotiation with their former enslaver to legally purchase them. Another reason why freedom fighters were coming over across the Atlantic is that they well recognized that Britain was not only built on the wealth of the transatlantic slave trade and slavery, but it continued to profit from slavery around the world. So in the 1850s, 90% of the cotton that was coming into Liverpool was coming from the US South. It was slave grown on the plantations from the US South. And you had men like James Watkins, who I'm going to be talking about later, 
who would say to his audience, if you could hear the groans of the slaves and witness for a moment their sufferings, you would never again touch Savannah rice. You would feel like you were eating the blood and bones of the Negroes. That's a direct quote from Watkins' lecture. So Watkins was essentially trying to get his audiences to be a lot more thoughtful and aware of the origins of the products that people bought and consumed on a daily basis, which is obviously still true for us today. And the last reason why African-Americans were coming over here was sometimes to temporarily find work or to live here or sometimes permanently to stay here. And many of them lived out the rest of their lives on British soil. And just to say on that point, Britain was no racial haven for a lot of these African-Americans, but they still came over to live the rest of their lives here. And just while I have the map up, just to finally say in their lectures, they were talking about various things. They talked about those realities and brutalities of slavery. They talked about escaping the Southern states. They talked about the rape and brutalization of black women, the separation of husband and wife, mother and child on the auction block. They spoke about the hypocrisy of American independence, again, boycotting enslaved produced goods. They spoke about the racism they experienced in the US and in Britain as well. And they also spoke about black heroic figures like Toussaint Louverture and the Haitian Revolution. They spoke about Manningston Washington who led a slave revolt on a slave ship. And many spoke about Margaret Garner who is a freedom fighter who escaped slavery in the 1850s with her husband and young children. And when cornered by white oppressors, she actually slit the throat of her youngest daughter so that she would not have to live in slavery. And the very last thing I'll mention is they were speaking to all different types of audiences, working class, middle class, upper class, sometimes specifically women's audiences, sometimes specifically children's audiences as well. And as we're talking about Kirk Lees, what I'm going to do now is I'll put up a slide of some of the activists who were actually coming to the Kirk Lees area. So this is a screenshot from the website that I was just showing you. And as you can see, there were numerous African-Americans who visited the Kirk Lees area between the 1830s and the 1890s. And this is not an exhaustive list. These are only the, the folks that we know about so far. And many of them I'm going to be talking about in a little bit. And what you can do on the map, if it's of interest to you, you can zoom into the map and some of those numbers will sort of dissipate to the particular area. You can click on a colored pin so you can see the blue pin there that represents a lecture by Moses Roper. And we can try and find out who spoke there, the date, the venue, if we know it. Sometimes we don't. Um, but again, some of the folks that are represented here, Moses Roper, Frederick Douglass, William and Ellen Craft, James Watkins, Henry Box Brown and Sarah Parker Remond, I'm going to be talking about in a fair bit of detail. So what I'm going to do now is share my screen again to get up a brilliant uh, Google Earth um, web browser that again was very kindly created for this tour. And this is the first site. So we're going to start in Huddersfield and more specifically the Ramsden Street Congregational Chapel. And this is where it used to, where it used to stand. So very much on the, the site of Huddersfield uh, Library here today. And again, I'll show you some images as well of what the chapel used to look like. Um, so I'll do that now as well. All right. OK, so we've got these brilliant and beautiful images from the West Yorkshire Archive Service um, of the Ramsden Street uh, Congregational Independent Chapel in Ramsden Street in Huddersfield. And it opened its doors in 1825. And this chapel welcomed at least two activists, including Moses Roper in 1846 and also the Reverend Samuel Ringold Ward in 1854. And for Ward, the local newspaper, the Huddersfield Chronicle reported that, and I'll quote, the novelty of hearing a black man deliver an address attracted a large audience and he appeared to rivet attention the whole of the time as he spoke. And there are some more beautiful images of uh, the chapel here. 
And the chapel closed in 1933 and it was taken down three years later to make way for the Huddersfield Central Library. And I'll also mention as well here that the Halifax Express of March 1840 reported that Moses Roper, and again I'll quote, delivered an address in Ramsden Street Chapel in Huddersfield and exhibited the fetters with which the slaves are bound and produced a very strong feeling of indignation to the audience against the horrors of slavery and the cruelties of slaveholders towards their slaves. And this is Moses Roper and the only known image that we have of Roper. And he was born in 1815 in North Carolina. He suffered from horrendous torture and abuse at the hands of his white enslavers after he tried to escape between his count 16 and 20 times. Each time he failed to escape, he was arrested, tortured and incarcerated. He eventually managed to escape and travelled to the British Isles. He wrote a slave narrative, which is regarded as one of the first containing illustrations of slavery, including scenes of him being tortured in this book. And within 10 years, this book had sold about 38,000 copies across Britain and Ireland, and even 5,000 copies purely in the Welsh language for when he was traveling around Wales. And across Britain and Ireland, Roper's speeches and performances were often an unrelenting and brutal tale of slavery, focusing on descriptions of torture that he had personally experienced or witnessed. And what's fascinating about Roper is that he refused to compromise over his barbaric accounts of lynching, of barbarity, which sometimes alienated and sometimes threatened the success of his overall message because he was speaking to predominantly white audiences who had no understanding of what US chattel slavery was. And Roper had a lifelong career of public anti-slavery activism and he, because he refused to compromise on those descriptions, he encountered a few controversies. And one of the my favorite anecdotes about Roper is that he often spoke about religious denominations in the US South that either supported slavery or refused to condemn it. And he spoke once in England in a Methodist meeting house. And he talked about how the Methodist religion in the US South supported slavery. And a lot of the English Methodists in this particular Methodist chapel objected to what Roper was saying, and they demanded that he stand up and apologize. And what Roper did instead, everyone thought he would recount his statement and apologize, but he stood up and said, my mother was enslaved by a Methodist, which completely ended the meeting as uh, there was uproar as he had refused to do what the white Methodist and white English Methodists wanted. And similarly, before another meeting in Birmingham, Roper was advised by a religious minister to actually tone down his violent descriptions of slavery. But Roper only said in reply, I shall tell the truth. So in lecture after lecture, Roper relayed horrific stories of violence and torture, murder, mass suicide, and there are occasions when his predominantly white audiences, white newspaper correspondents, and even white abolitionists tried to ruin his reputation, to ruin the success of his lecturing tour, because sometimes they believed that he was lying about those experiences. And his experiences and discussions of violence were almost beyond their understanding. So in their thinking along a white racist schema that he assumed that the African-American in front of him, in front of them, was lying. And some newspaper correspondents wrote about him with the most vitriolic, the most racist hatred. They accused him of just memorizing torture in books about the Spanish Inquisition, for example, that these things weren't happening at that moment on US soil. And one of the most devastating slanders that happened with Roper came from one of his former supporters and a white abolitionist called the Reverend Thomas Price who had originally helped Roper out when he'd first arrived in English soil. And Price had supported Roper because at one point Roper had expressed a desire to become a missionary to the African continent. And when Roper changed his mind about that career, as we're obviously all prone to do as people and as humans, 
Price was incensed. He actually denounced Roper in the public press as a beggar, as a liar, who had preyed on his philanthropy, essentially. And this was really damaging to Roper's reputation. It restricted some of the places where he could lecture. He doesn't lecture in London very often, for example, because Price had a lot of influence there. And to defend his reputation, Roper wrote a letter in the public press. And he wrote of his anxiety that he had mounting debts to pay because a lot of avenues of support were closed to him. He was unable to sell copies of this narrative that we're looking at for his own survival. And he was terrified of being dragged into debtor's prison. Now, as we know, Roper would have faced severe trauma based on that particular thought because he'd been incarcerated and tortured so often on US soil. But in this letter, it's a powerful example of how Roper refused to let white abolitionists like Price control his life. And despite what would happen to him, he wanted the public to make sure that if he did go to prison, it would not be his fault. Price was the direct cause of his misfortunes. And as far as I can tell, he didn't go to prison. But this particular episode is so important because it reveals that just because you were an abolitionist or you identified as an abolitionist, it didn't mean you were anti-racist. And there are numerous examples of white abolitionists jeopardizing black abolitionist missions across the, uh, the British Isles. They wrote very racist or patronizing descriptions of people of color, and they often refused to offer support, even if a particular activist was in very dire circumstances. But just to show you another uh, amazing find from the archive service, in a diary entry from John Stency Crossley, who had connections with the chapel, he founded the Mutual Improvement Society, he actually notes that on the 19th of July, 1846, a Negro who had escaped from slavery in America addressed the Ramsden Street Chapel Sunday School children in the afternoon. Now, this could potentially be uh, another speech by my, Moses Roper, or perhaps even a lost speech from Frederick Douglass himself, as Frederick Douglass was traveling around England in 1846 as well. But just to finish on Roper as well, in February 1847, Roper delivered a lecture in the Lane Schoolroom in Holmfirth. And again, I'll quote from the newspaper report, Roper stated the various hardships he endured whilst a slave and detailed the manner in which he escaped from the slaveholders and the difficulties he had to contend with on his journey to Canada. The audience was very large and respectable and appeared to be highly gratified with the lecturer's statement. So we'll move on to our second stop then. So I'm just gonna stop sharing the PowerPoint and I'm just gonna get up again the Google Earth. So to go on to the next site. So really it's literally a, just a short hop from where we are standing, because again, this is Rams Ramsden Street and we're going to be talking about the Philosophical Hall. And this is another angle uh, here. So this is where the, the hall would have stood. So I'm sure this site is very, very familiar to, to many of you who either live or know Huddersfield. So again, this is the second site on, on the tour and I'll show you some contemporary images of what the the hall would have looked like again courtesy of the archive service so bear with me a second and i will get up my powerpoint so this is the philosophical hall in ramsden street ramsden street even in huddersfield and there are these two um, beautiful images from around the 1880s and also the 1930s and the hall was opened in 1837 it was built by the Huddersfield Philosophical Society as a public meeting venue. But nearly 30 years later, the hall was bought by an actor and theatre proprietor, so Morton Price, and it was turned into the theatre. And unfortunately, a fire damaged the hall in 1880. It was rebuilt the following year, but the building was taken down in the 1960s. And it was here that Frederick Douglass lectured in March 1847. And I'm sure most of you have heard of Frederick Douglass. He was the most famous African-American of the 19th century, a radical activist for abolition, equality, feminism and social justice. He led an unrelenting fight against racism, slavery, white supremacy his entire life. And he was an incredible speaker, author, poet, journalist, editor, to name a few. 
and his escape from slavery in 1838 with the integral help of his future wife, Anna Murray, would signal a real dramatic turning point in the anti-slavery movement. And I always like to mention Anna Murray Douglas here because there would not be a Frederick Douglas without Anna Murray Douglas. She was an activist in her own right, a conductor on the Underground Railroad, so the network of series of safe houses that would transport freedom seekers from slavery in the US South all the way up to the Northern States and, um, and the rest of the US and um, Canada and Britain as well. She was an activist in that she looked after the home and raised their five children. All of these roles are activists in their own right. Now, to go back to Douglas, he was hired as an anti-slavery lecturer by the white radical abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison, who was based in Boston and led the American Anti-Slavery Society. And Douglas traveled around the east coast of the US before setting sail for the British Isles in the summer of 1845. And Douglas had published his slave narrative in the spring of that year, in the spring of 1845. He'd named and shamed his former enslavers and there was uh, a chance that Douglas would be recaptured and seized and sold back into uh, slavery because he had exposed his former enslavers and those brutalities. So in part, he comes to Britain for his own safety. And he is a sensation in Britain and Ireland. He speaks over 300 times in less than, 200, in less than two years. He exposed slavery in his own words because to expose it is to kill it. Slavery is one of those monsters of darkness to whom the light of truth is death. By ripping the mask from its face, it would be exposed to the sun and with a wall of anti-slavery fire, burn away from the land. And Douglas was so popular that tickets often had to be issued for his meetings. And there are some incredible anecdotes from the British press that really attest to his level of fame. So one of my favourites is that he gives a speech in Colchester in Essex in March 1847 and hundreds of people are, are cramming into the, the chapel to hear him speak. Hundreds of people are turned away at the door, but there's a few enterprising folk who manage to um, go to the side of the chapel and crane their necks and stand on tiptoes to listen to, hear, listen to him speak, such as that desire to hear him speak. Now, Douglas gives this lecture in March 1847 at the Philosophical Hall in Huddersfield, shortly before he heads back to the US. And at this point, Douglas was physically and mentally exhausted. As I mentioned, he'd given over 300 lectures. He was desperate to get home to see his family and his young children. He'd obviously been apart from them for nearly two years. He'd sold over 13,000 copies of his slave narrative, as I mentioned. He created or reinvigorated anti-slavery societies on this side of the Atlantic. Uh, he raised thousands of pounds for the American Anti-Slavery Society, and he maintained and created connections with British and Irish abolitionists during that tour, but for the rest of his life. And he actually called upon those same abolitionists once again when he returns to Britain in 1859. Now, in the autumn of 1859, the radical white abolitionist John Brown, who some of you may have heard of, launched an assault on Harper's Ferry, Virginia, in an attempt to spark an uprising of the enslaved population. And Brown had visited Douglas for a few weeks while planning this particular raid and insurrection, and Douglas was deeply knowledgeable of Brown's act actions. So Virginian authorities were quick to involve Douglas, whose letters they found in Brown's possessions after they captured him and, and executed Brown. So Douglas was implicated in this insurrection. He was forced to flee to Canada for his own and family's safety, and then he traveled to Britain. And he had been planning to visit Britain for some time, but obviously the insurrection was a catalyst in cementing those plans. And he landed in Liverpool in November of that year, and he worked with the white abolitionist Julia Griffiths Crofts, who was living just outside of Huddersfield at the time to plan a lecturing tour. Now, Douglas speaks about John Brown in the Kirklees area as well in 1859. And I just want to read you an excerpt from one of, the, one of his speeches where he defends John Brown and his actions. And he says, 
It might be a crime for a man on the deck of a pirate ship to strike down the captain and take her into the nearest port where the victims of piracy might be set at liberty. And in no other sense was Brown's act a crime. English people were apt to look upon Brown as one who had gone into a peaceable neighbourhood and had there created a deep-seated discontent and disturbance. But this was simply a picture of fancy. John Brown disturbed no such neighbourhood as this. He entered Virginia not when she was in a state of peace, but when she was in a state of war. For if a state of war existed anywhere on the face of the globe, it did at this moment on the soil of the southern states. Slavery was itself an insurrection and the slaveholders were an armed band of insurgents against the just rights and liberties of their fellow men. And echoing this really powerful language of civil rights, several times during this second trip to Britain, Douglas reiterates that, and again I'll quote, there can be no real peace where there was injustice. A very powerful and radical statement that would obviously echo throughout the generations to the civil rights movement and obviously to the social justice and Black Lives Matter movement today. Now, Douglas speaks again in Huddersfield during the second trip, this time at the Ramsden Street Chapel in March 1860, so the first stop on our tour. And the Huddersfield Chronicle, so the local newspaper again, writes that Mr. Douglas gave many striking instances of the horrible cruelties of slavery and showed how the slaveholders of America were supported by the most eminent divines in that country. Mr. Douglas re related that he was born a slave, that he owed his freedom to the people of this country and especially to the ladies of the North of England. He's referring to the Richardson family in Newcastle, who, when he first came to this land, subscribed 150 pounds and bought him from his former enslaver. Afterwards, the British people subscribed and bought a printing press for him, uh, for me, and sent him back again to America, where during the last 20 years, with his pen and press, he had laboured in the cause of his enslaved and downtrodden countrymen. And the correspondent here also notes that Douglas had talked at length about John Brown and defending John Brown as well. But tragically, his visit to Britain was actually cut short when he received the heartbreaking news that his youngest daughter, Annie, had actually died three weeks previously, and he returned to the US as soon as possible. Now, as we know, Douglas was not alone in speaking at the Ramsden Street Chapel or the Philosophical Hall. And while we're still virtually, at least, on the site of the Philosophical Hall, I want to talk about William Craft and Ellen Craft who were born enslaved just outside of Macon in Georgia. William Craft gave a lecture at the hall in 1855. Now, both William and Ellen Craft resolved to escape slavery over the Christmas period in 1848, and they devised an ingenious escape plan. So Ellen, who's pictured here on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, she was described at the time as the, the fact that she could pass for white, she had a fair complexion, and that was the result of her mother's rape by her enslaver. But the image on the right shows Ellen dressed in uh, male clothing. And what Ellen did is that she crossed the boundaries of race, of class, gender and physical ability to perform and dress up as a white southern gentleman with William, her husband, posing as her enslaved servant. Now, you can see the image here is actually flipped, but the white stretch or white bandage across her chest actually represents her bandaging her right arm because it was illegal and punishable by torture and death if the enslaved population could read or write. So Ellen had to disguise the fact that she was unable to do so and couldn't sign her name for train or steamboat tickets as they were making their way and as they were escaping from their plantation. So she used this cover of disability and hoped that in that moment, somebody else would perhaps sign her name. And it was a really huge risk and a testament to both their bravery, their genius, but particularly Ellen Craft's genius and performance that they managed to pull this incredible escape attempt off. Everything rested on her and her performance as this white Southern man. They were traveling outside of a county, outside of a state where they had never gone before. If they failed, they would have been subjected to torture, abuse, incarceration. They would have been forcibly separated from each other, never to see um, the other again. And you can read their 
Slave Narrative, which was published in London in 1860. It's called Running a Thousand Miles for Freedom. And as you could expect, it's an incredibly hair-raising read. And just to give you a, a brief anecdote from their escape and from this narrative, because of the Jim Crow customs in the 1840s, white people were obviously sat in a different carriage than African-Americans. So Ellen, posing as a white man, is sat in a whites-only carriage surrounded by white women, white men, many of them enslavers. And at one point, a man, a white man walks into the carriage and Ellen recognizes him as a friend of her former enslaver. So obviously she's terrified that he is going to recognize her. But the Crafts managed to make it to Philadelphia and then shortly they settle in Boston in Massachusetts. Now they aren't there very long when they hear rumors that their former enslaver has sent white men all the way up to Boston to drag them back down into slavery. So Ellen goes and stays with some friends for safety. William stays in Boston with another survivor of slavery called Lewis Hayden. And they lie in wait for these white slave catchers to approach them. And when they do, they throw open the door of Lewis Hayden's home and they shout to the slave catchers, we have lined the front door with dynamite, with explosives, as we would rather die than ever go back into slavery. And this very bold and brave tactic works. The slave catchers back off. It allows William some time to rejoin Ellen and they decide to travel over to England. And they stay here for nearly 20 years. They raise five children in freedom. Both traveled around the country extensively to denounce US chattel slavery, to also denounce the Confederacy during the US Civil War, so the alliance of Southern states that fought to preserve slavery. And Ellen Craft turned her home into a hub of black activism. She invites fellow black lecturers to stay there. She supports numerous reform causes like suffrage, for example. She went to private parties in London and challenged racist thinkers. And when she heard rumors that were going around the US that were essentially saying she wanted to go back into slavery, she had become bored of freedom. This letter had come from her former enslaver she wrote a public letter back that was published on both sides of the Atlantic, where she said, I would rather starve a free woman than be a slave for the best man that ever breathed upon the American continent. Now, in November, the Huddersfield Chronicle reported some of William Craft's speech from the Philosophical Hall. And I'll just read you an excerpt from that newspaper. Mr. Craft held it to be the duty of all men to aid in sweeping slavery from the sight of heaven. He considered slavery inhuman in practice and the greatest stumbling block both to civilization and Christianity. For it was quite clear that no man could enslave and brutify another without equally debasing himself. To obtain a comprehensive view of slavery, it was well to understand some of its fundamental laws. The slave code said a slave was one who was in the power of the master to whom he belonged one who could not own or acquire anything. They might imagine what the moral condition of the female portion of the community must be when stripped of all legal protection and left entirely at the mercy of unprincipled men. The wrongs and outrages slaves suffered were such they, that they could not be laid before a public audience. From having been a slave 23 years himself, he could say that he believed in the greatest curse which had ever blasted the happiness of man. And in this speech as well, William Craft goes into detail about the very hair-raising escape that obviously both of them um, had managed to accomplish. Now, moving on from the Crafts then, we're going to go to our third stop on the tour. So what I'm going to do is I'll share my screen once again to go to Google Earth. And we're going to head to the Upper Independent Chackle in Heckenwijk. Um, so a little bit of a journey through Google Earth here to get to this beautiful uh, chapel. And this building used to be the Upper Independent Chapel. Originally, it was located on Chapel Lane, but moved to the High Street in uh, 1845. And I'll show you some images um, of the, the chapel in a moment. This is a close up of the chapel. And the church was actually demolished and rebuilt on exactly the same site in 1890. And obviously, as you can see, the building still stands, but it is currently um, some flats. 
So what I'll do now then is I will head back to my PowerPoint so I can show you some images, again, courtesy of um, the archive service. Thank you for bearing with me. And here we are. So this is the Upper Independent Chapel in Heckman Work. And this is where James Watkins lectured. So born into US chattel slavery in Maryland, James Watkins escaped in 1845 and he settled in Hartford in Connecticut with his wife, Mary Eliza Watkins, and their two children. Now the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act forced him to flee to England. And this very draconian act passed uh, in the US meant that all freedom seekers or fugitives or even free people of color were in danger of being kidnapped, seized and dragged back down into slavery. And that was sanctioned by the federal government and it meant that even in their local communities, um, and even local communities in the north, they're expected to abide by that law. If they were caught sheltering a freedom seeker or a fugitive, they would have been subjected to heavy fines and even imprisonment. So Watkins escapes to Britain because he wants to protect his wife and his young children, but also the white and black community that had sheltered and helped him essentially get back on his feet after he had escaped slavery. So we don't have a contemporary image of James Watkins, unfortunately, but this is an image from his slave narrative or one of the editions of his slave narrative. And Watkins spends nearly a decade in the UK. He lectures against slavery, racism and segregation. He was a strong supporter of free produce, urging British audiences, as I mentioned at the start, to import free grown goods such as cotton from the India or African continent instead of relying on the importation of that slave grown cotton from the US South. And during his meetings, he often produced instruments of torture that were used on enslaved labor camps and from which he still bore the bodily and mental scars of such brutality. And he regularly recounted stories of religious ministers who owned enslaved people and thus, according to him and other black abolitionists who were saying a very similar thing in Britain, that in doing so, they were polluting the purity of Christianity. And Watkins publishes his story, his slave narrative in 1852. And it was actually first written by what we call an amanuensis. So it was, his story was taken down by a white author and presented in the first, first person as such as if he was writing it himself. And Watkins tells a story of his escape and also his travels around Britain. But what's really interesting is that Watkins revises his own narrative. So he ad releases editions in 1856, 1859, in the early 1860s. And he takes control of his own narrative and he starts to rewrite sections. He inserts new paragraphs. He takes out certain things. So the work very much becomes his own. And in later editions, he includes this very powerful phrase, I will never relax my efforts in attempting to put down that accursed system of human suffering, degradation and torture, slavery. So the other really interesting thing about Watkins is that in the later editions of his slave narrative, he is very candid about the experience or his experiences of racism in Britain. He struggles to find employment in Liverpool, for example, and he writes about racism and also the popularity of minstrel shows. So just again, just to quote you from his narrative to, again, so sort of hear his own voice, where Watkins says, to accomplish what I have done, I have had many difficulties to overcome and have experienced many dark hours of sorrow and disappointment and many a time have found it necessary to make one meal a day do. Through the ignorance and the prejudice of a certain portion of this community, we colored people have been calumniated and ideas have been disseminated in relation to us, which have no foundation in fact, but have only originated in the malice of people who have made it their business to misrepresent us. We have public exhibitions and low singing rooms of men who black their faces and perform such outlandish antics as were never seen amongst the Negroes and profess to imitate but who in reality only caricature men of my race. Though I have for 20 years been ground down under the relentless hoof of the oppressor and have tasted the bitterest dregs of slavery, I had rather that the laws of England would send me back into bondage 
than that I should ever be guilty of disfiguring my face in order to bring into contempt a race of men who have been injured and wronged as have the Africans, whose woes and sorrows should excite the sympathies instead of provoking the mirth and raising the laughter of more fortunate human beings. So this really powerful paragraph that Watkins writes is that he's talking about racism, he's completely denouncing minstrel shows that were incredibly popular in Britain, but he's specifically denouncing his many of his white audiences who would go to these minstrel shows, who would laugh, who would spread and promote those disgusting and grotesque stereotypes of people of colour that Watkins was writing about, and this is in 1860. Now, unfortunately, there are a few records left of his lecture um, here, but it's probable he was at the chapel in around 1861 because Watkins was lecturing numerous times in the nearby area. So the Huddersfield Chronicle reports that one lecture in Holmfirth was very successful. And again, I'll quote, from the numbers attending the, the lecture, it would seem that the meetings lose none of their interest. And Watkins also spoke in nearby Honley as well. He gave two lectures there. And the correspondent for the same newspaper notes that the second lecture in particular dwelt on his escape from slavery, his sufferings in the wilderness, how he was hunted by his cruel oppressors and their bloodhounds, and also how he was protected by the Indians. The marvellous incidents portrayed in the second lecture were thought to be even more interesting than those in the first and were listened to with corresponding attention. So that ends Watkins' story. So we're on to our last stop in the tour now. And what I'm going to do is go back to uh, the brilliant Google Earth to show you this last stop. And we're going to the Centenary Chapel in Daisy Hill uh, in Dewsbury. So again, we'll do uh, a wonderful little travel there. Um, and this is the, the site of the, the chapel. And we have records of Sarah Parker Raymond and Henry Box Brown speaking here. And the chapel was built in 1839. There's a closer vision of the chapel there. And it was just built to celebrate the centenary of Methodist worship in Dewsbury. And it remained a Methodist chapel until around 2007 when it changed to a Pentecostal church known as Dewsbury Elam Church. And again, what I'll do is I'll just show you a contemporary image of the interior um, of this chapel. So if I get my PowerPoint back up, there we go. And there's a great image on the left-hand side here of, of the chapel um, from the early 20th century. And the image on the right-hand side is of Sarah Parker Remond, who visited Dewsbury. Now, Remond was born free in 1826 to John and Nancy Remond, a social activist and social justice family, and from an early age became an abolitionist and an activist. She began her own career as an anti-slavery lecturer in 1857. And her family strongly believes in education. When a young child, Sarah Parker Remond was actually denied entry to the Salem Public School because she was black, even though she'd passed all of the relevant exams. So the family actually uh, moved from Massachusetts, where they were based, to Rhode Island to ensure that she had a good ed education. But this devastating event encouraged her father to fight for the desegregation of schools in Salem, which he was successful at. And Sarah was deeply committed to desegregation and anti-racism as well. In 1853, she was forcibly removed from a theatre in Salem and actually pushed down several stairs after she refused to sit in a segregated section of the theatre. And this is a really important moment. We've all heard of Rosa Parks, uh, very powerful actions a century later, but this is Remond in 1853. She actually sued the theatre for damages. She won and then forced the theatre to integrate its seating. Now, Raymond had great success at lecturing in England and Scotland in the late 1850s and the early 1860s. She travelled here in 1858. She revived dwindling anti-slavery societies. She published pamphlets and letters to the press. She spoke alongside Frederick Douglass during his second visit to Britain in 1859. She spoke passionately against slavery and about the plight of black women in particular. And some historians think that she was one of the first African-American women to, to speak on a public stage in the UK, and some argue that the first woman to speak on a British stage about slavery entirely. 
Now, during the US Civil War, like William and Ellen Craft, she fought against the Confederacy while in Britain. She urged British audiences to reject, again, that importation of slave grown cotton and rice from the US and import it instead from the India and the African continents. Remond trained to be a physician here in London and actually traveled to Italy to practice and she lived out the rest of her years in Italy. Now, while she was in London uh, studying, she actually published a, an autobiography of her life. And I just want to, again, provide an example of where we're listening to the words of these activists in, a test, in her own testimony itself. And she talks about her early life and, and struggles with racism. And she says, it seems important to state as prejudice against color has always been the one thing above all others, which has cast its gigantic shadow over my whole life. In joy or sorrow, whether pursuing the pleasures or business of life, it has thrust itself like a huge sphinx, darkening my pathway and at times almost overwhelming the soul constantly called to meet such a conflict. Let no one suppose that every member of the community treated us with mixed contempt and cruelty. No, thanks to the better part of human nature, there were those who would gladly have saved us from such an ordeal. Most gladly would they have enlightened with the spirit of justice a civilized people who thus willingly insulted any of the human family. But these were few, very few, only exceptions to the general rule. As a community, the most refined and the most vulgar treated every colored person, so far as their personal rights were concerned, worse than criminals. In such an atmosphere, so well calculated to crush out all the finer feelings and almost to make one despair, I grew to womanhood. So Sarah Parker Raymond was in Dewsbury in around January, 18, January 1860. And I haven't been able to find the exact uh, coverage of her speech, but in, anticipa in anticipation to hear her speak, one correspondent from the Huddersfield Chronicle wrote that there was very high anticipation for her lecture here in Dewsbury. And the correspondent wrote, her language is said to be exceedingly impressive and delightful and crowded meetings have welcomed her wherever she has stood up to advocate the interests of her oppressed people. So as we move towards the sort of conclusion of uh, our tour today, I just want to focus on the last person who also spoke here in Dewsbury, Henry Box Brown, who lectured here in June 1851. Now, Henry Box Brown was enslaved in Virginia and he called himself Henry Box Brown. Um, and some of you may have heard of him because he had a very successful um, escape from slavery. So he was born just outside of Richmond in Virginia and he trusted a, a white carpenter to make him a box in which he was uh, placed and he was left in this box for 27 hours and was posted from Virginia to Philadelphia. And this very famous image on the left hand side is, here, is him appearing out of the box. Now, he discovered that his obviously very dramatic escape from slavery lent itself very well to the entertainment stage. And he lectured around New England and he exhibited this famous box in which he'd escaped in. And in 1850, he is traveling around Britain. He remained here for nearly two decades. And what's really fascinating about Brown is that he was a performer, an actor, and an entertainer. And he changed his repertoire, rep repertoire even quite a bit to entice new audiences and also to stay relevant in front of his audiences. So one of the first early celebrities, if you like. And when he first came to Britain, Brown exhibited that famous box in which he'd escaped he even dramatically reenacted his escape attempt by boxing himself up, arranging for local people to sort of wave US flags, parade the box to the local train station where he was put on a train um, from Leeds to Bradford. And uh, when he reached Bradford, he sort of ceremoniously opened the box and out he jumped. And he also exhibited a panorama of slavery. So a panorama was essentially like an early form of a cinema screen. It was a huge painting on canvas, several thousand feet high and wide, and was used to depict several scenes. It was rolled up in one corner and then slowly pulled to the other side to give this impression of moving scenes. And on this panorama, Brown depicted the history of the African continent, the Middle Passage, the arrival of people of color in the Americas, the brutalities they faced in enslavement and in America as a whole, the separation of families on the auction block, 
And again, the panorama was unrolled from one side to the other to give this concept of movement, to give life to this idea of a timeline and this story of enslavement. Now, throughout the years, Brown added different scenes to this panorama, as I mentioned earlier, to stay relevant um, and to sort of offer a different performance. He added scenes for the Indian Mutiny, for example, in 1857. But he also became a hypnotist, a scientist, and he organized numerous entertain entertaining performances around Britain. And the other thing he does, which is fascinating, is that he also followed in the footsteps of other African-Americans to become an actor. So Ira Aldridge, who was an African-American you may have heard of, made his debut on the London stage as early as 1825. And Brown started acting in several plays in Margate in Kent in 1857, one of which was entirely based on his own life. And reviews in the, the press at the time called attention to the fact that Brown was a survivor of slavery and he was acting out his enslavement on uh, a public stage. And I think we have to try and consider here what that would have, or what that could have cost Brown on a nightly basis, acting out that trauma performing to predominantly white audiences who would have no idea what enslavement was like. And he also acts out the heartbreaking separation of his wife and children who he never sees again. Now, while we're still virtually, at least in Dewsbury, uh, I will sort of read you the uh, information from the local newspaper that notes Brown being in Dewsbury. So a correspondent for the Huddersfield Chronicle of Hannah, uh, June. Hannah, yes. sorry, I'm really sorry to interrupt you. I'm just conscious that we've just gone over that hour. So I just want to shout out that this is recorded. It will be available to watch this last bit if anybody needs to rush off from um, joining for lunch breaks or anything like that. So you'll be able to find them on the Kirkley's YouTube channel to be able to watch it again. Back over to you, Hannah. Thank you. Thanks, Jude. I promise I will be quiet in a minute. Um, so, yeah, just to read you that newspaper uh, extract. So it's from 1851. And the correspondent says, Mr. Henry Box Brown, the well-known fugitive slave, exhibited his unrivaled panorama in the large room behind the centenary chapel in Dewsbury. It set forth in very striking colours the awful extent and the vast amount of evil carried on in that so-called land of liberty. But the correspondent also says, we are sorry to say that the exhibition was but indifferently supported. So not many people may have gone to Brown's exhibition of his panorama compared to Frederick Douglass and James Watkins and William Craft, for example. But this marks the end of the tour. I hope it's inspired you to think of your local area in a completely different light, how Kirklees was part of the black freedom struggle in the 19th century. And perhaps most importantly, it's hopefully encouraged you to think about the heroism and courage of all the, the worries of social justice, which I've mentioned here, and particularly in the world we're living in, we should all share uh, in their hope that they had that we will one day live in a far more equal and just world. And again, just to reiterate um, what I mentioned at the start, thanks to all of these amazing people uh, here who made the tour happen, who worked hard to share archival information and images, who created the Google Earth tour, promoted the events. And this has truly been um, a very beautiful and collaborative project and I want to thank each of the folks mentioned here who um, made this possible. So thank you so much and if we have time for questions uh, I am around to answer them. So thank you and back to you Jude. Hello. Hello everybody. Hi, uh, <laughs> wow. Well just to quote uh, from the James Watkins article uh, Dr Murray, you had my corresponding attention Throughout the whole of that tour, it was absolutely awesome. It made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Uh, so much interesting, have to admit sobering, uh, but very rich history uh, on all the abolitionists that you featured. And, you know, also the images and the articles featured that were very Kirkley centric, which actually makes it... Um, you know, interesting on another level for, for those of us that live in this geographical area. There's so much um, that I could say in respect to, you know, what you've shared with us. But in respect of time, I'm going to move straight on to questions. Uh, we have three that I'm aware of. So I'll kick off with the first one. 
And the first one is the theme of this project is very important for young people to understand their history in our local area. How can we roll this out in schools and get younger, the younger generation aware and involved? If, if you've got any thoughts. Yeah, thanks, Louise. And, and thanks for all your help and support on the project. You've been in that, invaluable to making this happen. So thank you. And it's a really important question because I think that's the first question or thought that our mind jumps to, you know, apart from, oh, we know we didn't know this history, is that this needs to be taught in schools. And um, I've worked with several schools before and developed teaching resources. And I think that this beautiful collaboration that we've we've all created, I think we're going to be taking this forward and, and, and sort of adapting some of those teaching resources and, and approaching local schools in the area. And for those of you who have an interest, and I think the easy way to try and get these um, this, this work and this research and this activism you know, being taught in schools is is that collaboration between activists, between educators, between um, you know archivists as well to 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 really push schools and teachers to to try and incorporate their local history because this is a local story as well as a national and international story. And um, I think the other thing I'll say as well is that you know it's a really great jumping point to be able to include stories of Black British activism in in Kirk Lee's as well as obviously telling that really important national story of, of black British activism too. Um, so I think the, the collaboration is is, a, is such an important um, element for that, for sure. Okay, thank you. I'll move into the second question. How much of an impact can the black abolitionist <clears throat> history have with regards to providing a platform for listening to the voices of individuals from the black community to those in power, especially in view of the more recent efforts of, black, of the Black Lives Matter movement? Yeah, thank you for that too. I think one of the things that we tried to highlight in our tour is very much the voices and the testimonies of um, those former enslaved or the, the survivors or those who've experienced racism. So highlighting those voices is, is such an important element from the 19th century, but also to now, you know, to think about the social justice and Black Lives Matter movement today. I think that we should all be um, working together to creating those, those parallels to thinking, you know, to think about those um, those links between past and, and present and what perhaps abolitionists in the past can teach us about the social justice movement today. Um, but also I think in a lot of ways it's for, um, you know, activists and again, ad educate, educators in particular, um, folks like me, but also within our community at large to sort of say broadly, as people were, sometimes saying in the 19th century, I see you, I hear you, I believe you. You know, those are three statements that, um, you know, we should be um, listening to, responding and, and, and sharing with um, the black community, those who experience racism and those legacies of, of slavery. Um, and again, for sort of white allies as well, white communities, or white, white allies like myself, it's, it's not only thinking about those three sentences, I see you, I hear you, I believe you, but creating platforms for the black community, um, you know, to enact, to allow them, you know, to allow you to share your voices and your testimonies um, and um, to listen and create space for those stories. And, and just to sort of end, um, when Frederick Douglass created his first newspaper, The North Star, that he was only able to create with British donations as well. In the first edition, you know, he basically, he has a very powerful statement where he says that, um, you know, we want to work with white allies, but they have to essentially provide people like me with a platform because I have experienced racism you know people in the white community haven't so you have to create the space for me to tell my story and support that in so many ways okay thank you and our final question what other resources are there that people can access to find out more about this topic and learn more about our local history yeah, that's a great question. So if we're talking about this history broadly, um, if folks are interested, I run a virtual uh, walking tour of London and um, Jude very kindly mentioned my book, Advocates of Freedom. Thank you for putting the link there. Um, and there's also a website which is based out of the University of uh, North Carolina in Chapel Hill called Documenting the American South, Documenting the American South. And that is a really great resource because a lot of this narratives that I've mentioned, you can read that on, you know, online for free. Um, but again, sort of more specifically for the local area of Kirklees, 
Um, Jude mentioned again the curated book collection and uh, I think um, obviously just speaking with the, the local archive service like West Yorkshire Archive Service and, um, uh, and, and those sorts of um, areas as well. Okay well thank you I think uh, that's all we've got time for in, in regards to questions but just in terms of uh, closing um i'm really hoping that this is just the beginning uh, and there is just so much more we could do with this information and this topic locally um so for me i'm hoping you know we've we've just started the journey and there's a lot more to come out of it um i don't know if jude would like to say anything uh I, before I just we close. Want to say that we've just i've just been screening some of the well screening looking through some of the comments and okay. and looking where people have been watching from and all over the country and um somebody has been watching from qatar as well yay which is lovely <laughs> <laughs> so i just want to say and I, I hope I well, I know this is echoing everybody who's been involved in the project that it's been an absolutely fabulous project to be part of. It's been a wonderful partnership, a wonderful collaboration. And we have this tour that will be archived now and people can return to and watch again. And as Louise has been saying, you know, it's looking at where next really with with this, because for me, particularly, I get super excited about um, the best-selling author <laughs> bit, but also this information that many of us probably weren't aware of until beginning this research. And this joy of being able to share it more widely it is wonderful. And I just want to say a big, big thank you, Hannah Rose, for being so encouraging and so enthusiastic and just been great to work with and the same with everybody else who's all the partners with Shosha Archives, Local Studies, obviously Louise and Kirkley's Libraries. Oh and Community Cohesion as well, Mohammed who couldn't join us on screen at all today but he's been helping loads as well so we've run over loads so that's the longest I've ever run over by but it was totally <laughs> worth it. Sorry so, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was absolutely worth it. We've managed to answer a few of the questions as well and yes I think all it is is to say you can find out more uh, through Kirkley's Libraries, Local Studies Libraries, West George Archives and the information that Hannah's given you and on Hannah's wonderful website frederickdouglasinbritain.com I'm hoping <laughs> um, and yeah we all need to just say bye and grab a coffee. <laughs> bye everyone. See you later. Thank bye. you.